I would like to thank uh, Arizona Bio for this opportunity to present uh, the new uses for existing drugs and some of the applications for COVID-19 and especially for Valley Fever um, in Arizona. Before I begin, I'd like to give a, a little bit of an outline of this talk. It's um, it's 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 going to be talking a lot about drug repurposing, and as a result, I'm I'm going to spend a little bit of time on. Uh, the drug approval process and the rationale and reason why drug repurposing is so important. I'll then start talking about the launch of a new a, a consortia within uh, the Critical Path Institute called the Cure Drug Repurposing Collaboratory. It's a new public-private partnership that uh, really has been stood up to try to address drug repurposing. I'll then um, talk a little bit about what Cure ID is and how we're partnering with Cure ID to uh, address uh, the concerns about drug repurposing, and um, and then uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the diseases of high impact, especially to, to Arizona. So before I begin, uh, as I mentioned before, let's talk a little bit about what the FDA approval process is for for drugs, and and essentially it's uh, a manufacturer or a, or a drug pharma company that uh, wants to uh, market a drug within the United States, and so that sponsor, what we call the drug sponsor, needs to submit a new drug application called an NDA, and what the NDA is essentially is a large document that dictates all of the and provides all of the information, all the data, all the analysis, as well as the pharmacokinetic, um, the, the, the way that the drug actually behaves in the body um, and how the drug is manufactured, how it's um, produced, um, how it's stored, and how it's distributed. So uh, at this process takes roughly about a year, sometimes even two years, depending on how many uh, questions that the FDA have during these meetings. But upon approval, the drug is then labeled for the disease that uh, the sponsor, that drug sponsor, actually provided the information for. So there is substantial evidence for the effectiveness of a particular disease. However, once a drug is approved, and really based on the knowledge and, and the judgment of physicians, they actually can take the responsibility for prescribing drugs for a completely different indication. Um, and in this case, what uh, what's uh, what, what that is called is off-label use. And if you're like me, or for for example, many other people, why would a physician then treat somebody off-label? Well, there's actually a significant proportion, a percentage of the world's populations that suffer from diseases with no approved therapy. And many others, there are they suffer from diseases that may have approved therapies, but they are unable to really benefit from those therapies. And an example of this would be, for example, drug resistance. So there are some diseases that are just become resistant to the drugs that we have. Now, diseases still lack um, the medical treatment um, uh, to slow or stop or reverse their course uh, do often result in mortality, but it's also important to pause and, and remember that this also can result in distress and morbidity and reduced life quality. And those aspects are oftentimes not really discussed very much. And we can also also see this oftentimes when we talk uh, in, in, in recent days with regards to COVID. Now, some examples of some off-labeled use includes different populations. Oftentimes, pe pediatrics, children, are, are not really included in clinical trials. They are oftentimes excluded for a number of reasons. Um, and then there's also also times of rare diseases, and, and sometimes rare diseases aren't um, included in in the uh, in 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 the portfolio of these different companies, um, not uh, not for more reasons than there just is a lack of data uh, surrounding it because it is a rare disease. Now, talking about rare diseases, uh, you know, can drugs be repurposed and and used for them? Um, and and really, the the best example I can give is uh, an individual that I was recently introduced to. His name is David Fagenbaum. He was a actually a pro athlete, uh, a football player back in college in in 2006. Um, went to medical school and uh, just after he finished medical school, came down with a a deadly disease, and he wasn't sure what he had took them a little while to figure it out, but once they did, they found out it was a rare disease. It was called Castleman disease. He had a name for his disease, but um, it required a, a extensive treatment with chemotherapy and uh, a lot of really potent drugs. 
Unfortunately, uh, fortunately, he was able to recuperate, but unfortunately, he, he relapsed about three or four times over the course of the next three or four years. He uh, eventually uh, extinguished all the available uh, therapies that were available to him. And uh, unfortunately, he was left with no drugs in order for him to treat his, his, uh, his condition. He uh, then dedicated his life um, in 2014 to be able to find a cure for his disease because he knew he couldn't just wait for somebody to discover something. He actually had to go out and, and do it himself. And he founded the, the Castleman Disease ne Collaboratory Network at the uh, University of Pennsylvania um, and has since pioneered an approach to the discovery and clinical development of drugs for repurposing. And he, David now has been uh, remission free uh, and, and uh, uh, disease free for over six years now. And he's chronicled his story in, in Chasing My Cure. And I, I think that it's a, it's an excellent book if, if people want to learn more about his amazing journey and his amazing story about drug repurposing. But are there other examples? Well, there are a growing list of drugs being used off-label for the treatment of diseases. There are approximately 1,500 FDA-approved drugs available now, and they are being used for about 2,500 different diseases. But there are many more diseases that have very little investment or very little interest in finding a cure. Uh, just in rare diseases alone, there are 7,000 and only about 500 actually have a drug treatment that is FDA approved. Anti-infectives, the, the issue with regards to drug resistance has been a growing problem over the past 20, 25 years, yet there hasn't been as much um, interest and in, in financial incentives for drug companies to develop uh, new drugs that we do, do desperately need. And it's not unusual. There's uh, the, the de novo drug discovery development pipeline as depicted in this slide takes a long time, is more than $1 billion. Um, usually about one in 10,000 compounds actually succeed in, in reaching the drug registration stage. And um, as a result, there's um, very little interest uh, if there isn't um, a, a return on investment that the company sees in the end, because this is not, uh, a, uh, these are all for-profit companies. But are there other ways? And, and this is where drug repurposing comes in, because uh, there are compounds that fail in different phases of clinical trials. An example of this is remdesivir, which actually was a drug developed for Ebola went through the preclinical studies, went through phase one, but failed in phase two. However, once coronavirus hit COVID-2, the um, uh, people in the lab found that there was actually uh, activity against the virus, um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, in vitro and quickly initiated a phase three trial uh, to ensure that uh, there was actually efficacy of that drug, and, and there was. So this is a, a, an example of, of drug repurposing in action that just happened uh, not too long ago. So can we identify potential novel uses of existing drugs by looking at off-label use? Um, and in order to do this, we have to look at what's called real-world data. And real-world data is really data relating to a patient's health status on or delivery of the health care that is being routinely collected from a variety of different sources. It's not clinical trial data, um, so it's a little bit messier, but we can learn a few things about looking at real world data. We can learn about new ways of treating diseases. We can look at new ways of combining different drugs to be able to treat those diseases. New regimens or durations of the way in which those, those uh, drugs are being administered, whether they can be administered for shorter periods of time, but yet still remain effective. New populations, such as pregnant women, could they benefit from existing treatments? But one of the most important things also that we should, should uh, also keep in mind is that we can also use this to discover ways in which unapproved uses actually don't work or are harming patients. Because that's an important point that we always need to keep in mind. So how can we use existing drugs and collect them so that promising drug candidates and treatment regimens are, are quickly identified and that then clinical trials are conducted to investigate whether those new uses actually do work or they don't. 
Well, one way of doing this, and this is going back to that same uh, graph that I showed a couple of slides ago, is actually taking a look at those existing drugs that are already approved. And rather than looking at drugs that have failed, looking at drugs that are already approved so that they um, have the shortest time for approval. And there are a few examples um, of this that, uh, that have uh, been approved in, in recent years. Thalidomide, although it uh, has a, um, a bad connotation because of the, uh, the, the deformities that were uh, seen when pregnant women took thalidomide, but um, there are other diseases, including multiple myeloma and uh, a, a complication of leprosy where thalidomide is actually um, has, has a very good prognosis of, in, in those con conditions and cases. And, uh, and another example is retinoic acid for a different type of leukemia. So there are uh, potential pathways forward. And as a result, um, the scientific community has come together and launched a public-private partnership um, where CPATH is leading this partnership with FDA and NCATS. This is an NIH institute. And this public-private partnership uh, was launched in June of 2020 to bring in those stakeholders together to address how drug repurposing can be accelerated. And we hope to identify, and uh, the partners are, are listed at the bottom here, a clear pathway forward for both generating adequate evidence from randomized clinical trials. So the, 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 uh, the normal way in which uh, information is gathered um, and then submitting that evidence for, for FDA for review. So the mission of this public-private partnership known as the Cure Drug Repurposing Collaboratory is really to become that central global source of validated real-world data in order to advance drug repurposing for diseases of the highest unmet medical need. Um, the rationale obviously is that there is, is really for the patients. There are millions of patients that are millions of patients that are struggling with diseases that lack adequate treatment. Um, and we do know that healthcare professionals are using off-label use of drugs um, in cases where there, there just isn't a, a treatment available. But the, the, the issue here is that there's no real ability to share these experiences in a systematic manner with other professionals in the clinical community. So the strategy that we've come up with is, is, is to find a way in which we can capture those off-label use of, 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 of drugs identify those drug leads through some sort of advanced analytics, um, through partnerships in, in, the, in the collaboratory, uh, generate a hypothesis to be able to inform, is there a, a, uh, a signal uh, within that data set that can inform the design or the utility of a particular drug and that that can be tested in a randomized control trial, which is called an RCT, of an existing marketed drug for, for an indication. And because we have the FDA um, and we're also talking with uh, other regulators such as the EMA, the European equivalent, we want to be able to bring those groups together, those regulators together with the sponsors to be able to start having some of those discussions um, in, in a more meaningful way. So the goal is really to facilitate the labeling that accurately reflects how a drug is actually used in clinical practice, harnessing not only this real world evidence, but then um, supplementing that with traditional clinical trials. And FDA fortunately had a tool already in its, in its arsenal. They, they have a platform um, called uh, CureID. It's, uh, it has, a, it has an, an ability to capture and share real world experiences of treating patients through a simple online case report form. So individuals that are treating patients that may not have um, the best prognosis or are being treated off, uh, off label can contribute that information uh, in a database. Uh, other physicians that may have similar types of patients can explore to see what other doctors have done to prescribe different treatments to those types of patients that have those diseases. And more importantly, they can discuss amongst each other questions that they have with regards to, to their different cases. This is a web-based tool that's available not only in a computer, but also on a smartphone and, and other mobile devices. All the data that's collected is, is what we call HIPAA compliant. That means it really doesn't contain any personal identifiable information. We're just talking about the disease itself and trying to remove 
personal information from it uh, completely. There's a news feed, um, there's a link to clinicaltrials.gov, and that's important because what we want to do is not promote the use of off-label, but be able to ensure that uh, the physicians know that if there are clinical trials for that condition in the area, that they can refer their patients to those clinical trials, and we'll know a lot more information about that. So this app is actually currently available. It's uh, freely downloadable in Google Play and in the App Store. So I, I recommend uh, individuals to check that out. So the platform actually was launched in December of, of 2019, both by the, the FDA um, and uh, NCAT, which is the Center for Advanced Translational Science at NIH. Uh, and we've had support for, for, for this app uh, from a variety of different other organizations, including the World Health Organization, the Infectious Disease Society of America, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and another institute in, in, in NIH called the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And this app then really tries to collect this real world data that we were talking about before to identify new ways in which existing drugs are being used to treat diseases that have no approved therapy. Now, originally, when the uh, app was developed uh, back in 2013, the, the intent was really to take a look at uh, neglected tropical diseases. Obviously, there was always an interest in, in antimicrobial drug resistance. Um, there's um, a, a real need in, in, in certain populations, such as pregnant met women and neonates and pediatrics, as I already mentioned. The rare diseases is another thing. But obviously, over the last uh, six months or so, the newly emerging, re-emerging infections uh, is something that has uh, really come out to, to everybody's forefront. And so the CDRC, the, the, the public-private partnership that I'm talking about, those stakeholders are now um, taking a look at uh, using co uh, the, this case collection uh, tool to be able to address COVID-19. So we're now collaborating to promote the use of, of this tool to collect those cases on those patients that are being treated. There, uh, there's um, a, an opportunity to reach out, incentivize clinicians to be able to contribute their cases uh, that they're, they're they're treating those pa these patients. There's more than five million people in the United States alone that have been identified um, as as being COVID positive. We're partnering with these different uh, COVID-19 disease registries to explore data sharing initiatives to make sure that we can share data amongst uh, the different groups. And we're working with healthcare systems to explore ways to share information through electronic health medical records. And the whole purpose of this is really then to generate real world evidence. The, the data then is, uh, is extracted to identify, is there efficacy and is it safe? And these case report forms that I was mentioning have now been tailored specifically also for COVID-19 because there are some uh, uh, interesting data fields that need to be tweaked and, um, and edited so that it uh, aligns better and is harmonized with other real world data and clinical trial platforms. And we've done that. And these activities are also being coordinated on a global basis with the World Health Organization through existing partnerships uh, with the FDA and WHO. So healthcare providers around the world are now through, um, through this app are being encouraged to share their, their treatment experiences. Um, and we're currently capturing data from both the literature, the things that uh, people are already publishing, as well as physicians that are treating COVID-19 patients. There's uh, roughly about uh, 70, actually a little bit more than 70 different drugs currently um, identified in COVID-19 in the app. It includes um, really patients who are unable to be enrolled in a clinical trial. And, and um, this is an important aspect is that uh, we wanna make sure that individuals who can't enroll in a clinical trial for a number of different reasons, at least uh, as they're being treated, um, that their treatment can, can contribute to the knowledge. And one of the, the um, issues that uh, most physicians have to deal with uh, when treating patients uh, with any drug is um, ensuring that there are no adverse events. And if there are adverse events, that those events need to be shared with FDA. And by 
um, contributing this data to CureID, um, the CureID app actually uh, shares that data, the, those adver adverse events that are found with FDA's own MedWatch adverse reporting system. So there's uh, uh, no need for the physician to actually enter data twice. The uh, identified signals in the data that can then be used uh, to inform clinical trial design and regulatory decision making for, for additional potential treatments using those repurposed drugs. And we're collaborating with a number of different uh, individuals and groups uh, around the world, um, looking at different ways of using machine learning, uh, advanced and in, uh, artificial intelligent techniques, um, and a variety of different database designs to be able to look at that in, in a more coordinated fashion. So data that is being collected in an outbreak hopefully can be improved coordinated. And this will allow us not only to find the possible treatment to help ease this pandemic, but more importantly, to prepare us better to fight the next one. So I'll stop talking about uh, COVID-19 and talk a little bit about some of uh, Arizona's other infectious diseases. And the one that I want to spend a, a bit of time is on, on valley fever. It's another one of the diseases that CureID is tracking of the 325 infectious diseases that uh, uh, are currently on, on CureID. It's a, valley fever is a, is a significant infectious disease in Arizona and, and also in California, but in Arizona, nearly one third of community acquired pneumonia is due to valley fever. It's a disease called uh, coccidioidiomycosis. The uh, infection occurs once uh, an individual actually inhales spores from the disturbed soil. Um, it's often times that uh, during sandstorms called haboobs that occur within the, the U.S. Southwest, uh, construction workers, agricultural workers are oftentimes uh, at a higher predisposition to uh, become infected, um, and, and that those individuals are um, have a, a number of uh, symptoms that uh, very similar have similar symptomology as as, as a pneumonia. Uh, what's an interesting now this year is that because of the no novel coronavirus infection, that adds a further complication. So is it pneumonia, is it COVID, or is it valley fever? Now, the majority of the, uh, uh, the individuals that are infected, very similar to SARS-CoV-2, are asymptomatic. But 40% have these self-resolving flu-like symptoms. Also similar to, to SARS-CoV, there's a small percentage of individuals who actually progress and develop a pneumonia. Um, and if unresolved, these infections then become chronic, resulting in the destruction of, of the lung tissue. And, and about 10% of those cases, those unresolved infections can lead to disseminated disease. And disseminated disease means that that pathogen now has gone outside of the lung and into other places in, in the body. And the most um, uh, problematic area, um, at least from a, a, a lethality uh, uh, part, is, is the brain. So uh, coccygeal meningitis is, a, is an important issue uh, that people need to deal with and causes roughly around 200 to 500 diseases um, uh, cases every year. There are risk factors regarding uh, valley fever. It's primarily on immunocompromised individuals, people that have undergone a transplant um, that need to be immunocompromised, for example, are, are at high risk. Pregnant women are at high risk because of their uh, reduced uh, immune response uh, as a result of pregnancy. And there is also um, uh, inter interesting uh, data coming that uh, certain minority ethnic uh, racial groups are often um, at, at higher risk of, of, an, of infection, including Filipino, uh, African Americans, and, and individuals of Asian descent. There's also an issue. Uh, Again, talking about uh, keeping on these immunocompromised uh, groups of individuals of older generation people um, in geriatrics having to use biologics such as Humira, Embrel, Remicade, Simzaya for treating a variety of different uh, in infections and diseases called, uh, such as arthritis, uh, plaque psoriasis, Crohn's disease, um, ulcerative colitis. There's uh, a number of these diseases, and these are essentially immunosuppressive agents. They're actually targeting TNF alpha, so they're TNF alpha blockers. But these agents predispose many of these patients as a higher risk group for contact for contracting 
um, not only uh, valley fever, but a number of different fungal diseases. And of course, in Arizona, valley fever is, a, is one of the, the major fungal diseases that, uh, that these patients come, come in contact with. And oftentimes their susceptibility is as high as 50%. Looking at uh, some, some of the stats of uh, Valley Fever for Arizona, this is from the Arizona Department of, of Health Services. There's uh, a little less than 7,500 reported cases in, in 2018. Uh, this was the, the last year that uh, we have data available. 94% of those cases were actually in three counties. That's of course Maricopa, Pima, and Pinal County. There were 715 hospitalizations with the primary diagnosis of Valley Fever resulting in $53.3 million in total hospitalization charges for all Arizonans um, with the, that primary diagnosis of valley fever. And that resulted in roughly around 51,000 on average as a charge per, per hospitalization with uh, 45 deaths attributable directly to valley fever. Um, and at the bottom here, you can see a, a little bit of a, a a chart showing uh, the incidence of valley fever over the past 10 years. Um, unfortunately, there or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, um, there have been some uh, differences in the way that valley fever is reported and how it's been tested and uh, it, over the over the past um, uh, over the years from between 2009 and 2012, um, and that's uh, resulted in, in a fluctuation in, in, in those in those reported cases. But as you can see from 2013 on, um, the disease incidence has been fairly steady. Um, and uh, both the reporting and testing practices have remained consistent throughout those years. So indicating that there's roughly about 100 or so uh, individuals per 100,000 population that are infected with uh, uh, valley fever. So I, I've gone through a couple of slides and at this point you may be saying, so what? Um, and the so what is coming to this particular slide in that there is no FDA approved drugs for treating valley fever. And some people are absolutely amazed that there is no uh, FDA or approved FDA drug uh, for treatment of, of this disease. There are treatment guidelines. If you go to the um, CDC website, uh, they call for oral azole compounds to be administered for at least a year. Um, oftentimes this is a fluconazole, but itraconazole has also been mentioned. There are serious side effects with these compounds, including nausea, vomiting, stomach aches, pain, diarrhea, um, and a variety of others. Um, so you can imagine somebody having to deal with um, these types of serious side effects um, for a period of a year. It's not, uh, it's not a, someone is not a happy camper. So um, there are issues with people actually um, maintaining and, and continuing on their therapy. There are several new drugs that are in the, the clinical pipe pipeline. In actual fact, there's one at the University of Arizona um, that is advancing. But there are currently, and I take, when I say current, it was is that uh, these are, are three newer medications that were found uh, in the in the early nine in the early or late 90s um, to treat more serious um, invasive forms of the infection, um, the ones that uh, potentially cause meningitis, for example. Um, and that these drugs are really um, meant to be treated, uh, treating those types of more invasive infections. Uh, however, again, these drugs are, are usually uh, administered um, intravenously. Um, they have much more serious side effects um, and uh, not necessarily um, have, have the greatest outcomes either. So uh, they're, they're not that great. Um, so we're always looking for new drugs and hoping that some of these newer drugs that are in the pipeline will actually work and, and help cure valley fever. But in the meantime, we need to start taking a look at what is already being used. And there are some potential valley fever projects that um, the CPATH group here at, at, uh, in Arizona would like to explore further. Uh, there are several valley fever centers of excellence uh, across the U.S. Southwest. One, as I mentioned, is at the University of Arizona. The NIH Council has approved an initiative to fund an additional four Valley Fever Centers of Excellence um, next year. So we're looking forward to having additional groups come and join um, uh, the, uh, the groups both in uh, that are currently in, in California as well as in Tucson. 
And what we are like wanting to do is partner with these Valley Fever Centers of Excellence to use CureID as a central data center to be able to collect that off-label use of drugs used to treat Valley Fever. Again, everything that's being used to treat for Valley Fever is off-label. So why not start taking that, uh, that initiative to be able to, to start collecting it and seeing if there are uh, little pieces of information that can uh, allow us to um, determine whether certain some 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 of these drugs are actually better than others or if there are some issues with regards to safety we want to collaborate with all of these centers to analyze the data together and publish the work obviously but the other element of this is is that we have um, fda and um, the interest of pharma to be able to identify potential paths forward to relabel these drugs to be used for treatment. So rather than using them off-label, we can actually get them FDA approved for that indication. Now, there are challenges. It's not as simple as just waving a wand. I realize that. And again, going back to that initial slide that I said, this whole process needs to be initiated by the drug sponsor. So in discussing this with the drug sponsor, is repurposing effort even aligned with their business strategy? And that's a question that needs to be addressed. Um, they may not have an interest to, to do that. What initiatives are there? Uh, or what incentives are there for, for a drug company to do that? Uh, what is the return on investment? Is there additional funding that may be um, uh, involved in, in helping guide and, and, and uh, uh, in, including the, the additional uh, clinical trials required to, to get um, approval? Then beyond that, then there are a number of intellectual property and patent protection issues. Uh, legislation currently impedes obtaining a patent for a second or further medical use of, of, a, of a compound. Now, it's, uh, I've mentioned it specifically as impeding because it is still possible to protect, protect a drug for a repurposed medical use, but it's not quite so simple or, so, or straightforward. The other more challenging issue is that repurposed uses that have already been reported in the literature or have already been exploited in clinical practice as off-label. That, since that information is already in the public domain, it may affect the no novelty and consequently the patentability of that drug for that use. So there are some challenges from a patent protection standpoint of those drugs. There are also, uh, if the drug is, is actually off patent, then that, that creates another set of series of, of, of issues. So if, if it's off patent, that new indication may be obtained, but how can you enforce it? Um, this could be an issue, especially if that new indication takes use of an already available uh, over-the-counter or generic drug uh, that's available in that same strength and the same dosage. So um, it, it becomes a, a difficult uh, in, a way of enforcing it. And even though you may try to enforce it through exclusivity, that may not be essentially an enough of an incentive. So these are, are discussions um, and conversations that uh, the groups need to come in together, both the drug sponsor as well as the regulator. And since the patient is in the middle, the patient needs to be involved in these discussions as well. So in summary, um, drug repurposing is a, is a fast and efficient way in which to secure treatments for diseases that have no or very limited options. Uh, CPATH has partnered both with FDA and NIH to launch this public-private partnership called the Cure Drug Repurposing Collaboratory. And its strategy uh, of, of, of this collaboratory is to globally deploy this Cure ID platform in order to capture how drugs are used by physicians to treat diseases in new ways. And the purpose then is to generate a hypothesis, generate information so that we can inform better um, clinical trials um, and work with stakeholders to advance the, re the regulatory approval of these drugs used to treat diseases of high unmet need. So how can CPATH and CDRC impact cures for diseases and interest in Arizona? Well, we're doing that right now through a pilot study with COVID-19 as an initiative. And we're currently securing the partners and, and exploring additional funding specifically for Valley Fever. And this is just the beginning. There are 323 other diseases that we are going to be looking at as well uh, in, in the coming years. Um, and we're gonna be um, prioritizing those diseases 
uh, not only infectious diseases, but also um, non-infectious diseases, uh, potentially rare diseases, um, and in different populations. So um, we hope to be making uh, an impact, um, not only in Arizona, um, but throughout the world as well. So I'd like to thank you and I'll open the floor up for additional questions if, uh, if you have any. Thanks.